A fortnight ago, I suggested that the coming month shape is an important one in gauging our progress thus far in 2018. The Saints and the Bulldogs have been struggling this year, but nonetheless such opponents had a habit of knocking us off in previous seasons, as we tended to put in one of our all-too-familiar dysfunctional performances that would open us up to playing a team in two form, or merely just giving a similarly middling team's fans something to cheer about. So I'm glad that, two weeks later, we've managed to bank 8 points and sneak back into the top 8. But have the last two weeks told us much about where our team is currently at? Or is it more representative of the current state of the league? The answer, in my opinion, is yes on both fronts. In both contests we were not switched on from the opening bounce, with the Bulldogs in particular jumping us out of the gate. In both games, we struggled to find easy avenues to goal in the first half, leaving most onlookers preparing themselves for yet another one of those disappointing losses. It tells me that we are still vulnerable, that we are nowhere near where we need to be in order to be considered a genuine threat come the business end of the season. On the other side of that coin however, is the fact that we managed to work our way back into the game, the coaches being able to arrest the state of play and make the necessary adjustments after halftime in order to get on top. Our win over the Saints was more of a shootout reminiscent of our clash against Brisbane, with Dugowie once more standing up as the match winner, whilst our win over the Bulldogs was a lot more satisfying given that we managed to completely blanket them in the second half, preventing them from registering another goal whilst we added 8 to our total and ran out 35-point winners. It's a league weaker this year than last. Quite possibly, however we've done enough to this point in the year to suggest that we've elevated ourselves beyond that mid-table bracket. Whether we stay at our current rung is entirely within our control and until we've cemented ourselves beyond this mid-table limbo, we cannot conclusively say that our improvement is permanent. Certainly, our experience from previous years recommends remaining guarded. As far as individuals go, there are a few stories to come from the last fortnight. I'll start with Matt Scherenberg, who is from week to week establishing himself as an integral cog within our defensive line, his emergence as a player dovetailing with our back line looking a lot more settled. Scherenberg's game isn't one of dynamic or eye-catching rebound, but is rather one grounded in composure and conscientious ball use rarely if ever being beaten one-on-one -on -one whilst always making the right decision when in possession. In his most recent game against the Bulldogs, he registered 26 disposals at an impressively rare 100% disposal efficiency. After enduring so many demoralizing setbacks, Scherenberg is in my view the best individual story at Collingwood so far this season. He's beginning to repay the faith whilst displaying the class that had him so highly rated as a junior. Given he was hobbled out of the blocks, I suspect he also has plenty more improvement to come, but even if he was to plateau and remain at his current output, he'll be one of our most important components down back. Tom Phillips is another who has kept building, maintaining his ball accumulating ability whilst having a more notable influence on our fortunes over the past month. I expressed some concerns over his long-term prospects earlier this year, but I'm more than happy to eat humble pie as Phillips continues to be a pillar of consistency. Brody Grundy continues to be a driving force out of the middle, but one can't help but fear that he may, at some point, succumb to the demands being placed on him. Fortuitously, he may not have to endure the crucible of battling it out with Sandilands this coming Sunday, however before he makes it to a much-needed and well-deserved mid-season break he'll have to face off against Max Gunn. Grundy has become just about our most important player and whilst he has perhaps been slightly shaded by Toby Nankervis and Stefan Martin, he is yet to have his colors lowered. 
Trelor has been a workhorse and our most prolific midfielder so far this year, whilst side bottom has been consistent but not as damaging in recent weeks as he threatened to be earlier in the year. Jack Crisp has been combining exceptionally well with the likes of Howe and Scherenberg to solidify our defensive line, being a little more conspicuous than both in terms of providing drive. Up forward is where we are still struggling to find the right mix, primarily due to injuries. We have been without Elliot to date, whilst Moore has made fleeting appearances before succumbing to injury once more. Fasolo made a brief appearance after building in the VFL, whilst Crocker presented regularly and covered plenty of ground, but struggled to have much impact on the scoreboard. As a result, we've had to rely on manufacturing goals through our midfield, although Will Hoskin Elliott, despite the propensity to flood in and out of games, has managed to register a goal in every game so far this year and has for periods threatened to do more. Given our woes in terms of personnel up forward, we've played Bagoe deep more often than not this year, which has paid dividends against Brisbane and St Kilda. Bagoe is a genuine talent, but whilst his best performances have provided highlights, those two games where he kicked bags demonstrate both his potential top-tier credentials whilst also hinting at our remaining vulnerability. If you remove Bagoe from those games, we may not have gotten across the line. Hypothetical situations are flawed of course, there's nothing saying, we may not have found other avenues to goal on both of those occasions. This seems unlikely though, as it was Tagoe's strength and attributes that created those opportunities, combined with his class in finishing to convert them. Without Tagoe in both of those games, our discussions would take on a very different tone at this point in time. With that said, consistency has still evaded Tagoe. Whilst feasting on the likes of Brisbane and St Kilda, he is yet to stand up to the same extent in some much-needed games, particularly against Richmond and Geelong. His preseason was knocked off the rail somewhat by his own misdemeanors and an injury niggle, but his second half of the season will be crucial in determining the extent of how valuable he is to our team heading forward. Personally, I suspect he'll rank as a player we cannot afford to lose, particularly given the age demographic he belongs to and where we're currently at as a team. Taylor Adams and Tom Langdon tend to be emblematic of our overall form within games. Both are capable of doing some extremely important things, but are also just as susceptible to making errors that prove extremely costly. I actually think Langdon has been fairly important in terms of our defensive structure. He can cost us goals by lagging off a direct opponent or with the occasional laconic blunder, but he's also a good reader of the incoming play who competes well in the air. He tends to find a fair bit of the ball, admittedly a portion of which occurs during switching of the play, but he does also get involved further up the field. Langdon's worst moments tend to occur when we're struggling as a team, but when we've gotten on top, it tends to coincide with when he tightens up his game and regains his composure. Adams is hitting mid-twenties in the possession counts, but he has spent significant portions of games completely off the boil. His turnovers tend to be of the most fatal variety, often when overrating his own ability by foot by trying to cut the ball back into the corridor. Worse still, his work by hand, which needs to be his bread and butter, has been hit and miss. He has managed to settle and contribute more effectively as the game wears on, but given his experience and internal standing, enjoying the status of an automatic selection, he needs to be much better if we're to consolidate and build upon our current position. The most concerning aspect of the season to date is once again our mounting injury list. We seem to lose one, if not two, players for everyone we get back. 
as mentioned earlier, we've been without the services of Moore and Elliott, two key components to this team, whilst Varka seems incapable of stringing more than three games together before breaking down. Wells and Reed are fragile in terms of durability and frustratingly, the next two players who seemed most likely to come out of the VFL ranks in Sear and McClarty both left the ground early on the weekend. Our season is likely to be shaped by how well we can, eventually, get on top and manage such injuries. If we can get some much-needed talent on the park and available for the second half of the season, we can potentially mount a real charge towards securing a spot in September. At the moment, however, we are only one or two injuries away from risking having the wheels fall off, particularly if those injuries occur to key players. Despite how well our VFL team has been performing, we are currently not being able to benefit from such available depth and the ensuing competition for spots. To the team's credit, they've been cracking in from week to week regardless, but to some degree it does feel like in terms of our fitness department, we are on the precipice once again. Our next two weeks ahead of the bye are going to be important. would be betting on a win against Fremantle at the MCG on Sunday, however our Queen's birthday clash with Melbourne is going to be the real test. Melbourne are in a rich vein of form at the moment and look significantly more dangerous than we do, so curtailing that whilst kicking a winning score is going to be quite the task. Heading into the bye with a record of 7-5 wouldn't be such a bad result, but if we can get the points against Melbourne it will go some way to offsetting some earlier losses which, on exposed form since those games, stand out as missed opportunities, I'm speaking of our losses to Hawthorne, GWS and Geelong. A win against Melbourne at the moment would rank on par with our win over Adelaide, as it'll be four points against a team above us on the ladder and would lend credence to the idea that we have in fact improved this year. I will be interstate for the next two weeks but I look forward to recapping what transpires when I get back to Melbourne. Until then, here's hoping we improve our first halves in the next two weeks and better still, remain in the winner's bracket.